It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then in chapter 2, verse 7, it makes another statement. And it says, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. In other words, the dirt. This Bible says that mankind did not evolve. It says that mankind was created. But it does not only just say that mankind was created, it even goes into some detail about how he was created. It specifically tells us that he was created out of dirt. The same chemical elements that makes up dirt is the exact same chemical elements that makes up your body. That's evidence. See, dirt in this picture would be like fingerprints. And dirt left every one of its fingerprints in our body. For everything in it is in us. That is what you call evidence. Then I want to look at this. I want to take these two pictures. Now, of these two pictures, you decide for yourself. Which picture required more thought? Which picture requires more design? Well, it's quite obvious. This picture that has the mountains, the trees, the beautiful colored skies, the water, has been designed. Now, I would ask you, the jury, today, in this trial, do I have to convince you that somebody painted this? I don't, do I? You know by the design, somebody did this. This, on the other hand, I took paint and just poured it down on this canvas. I pour paint on this canvas. From above it, I just pour the paint on it. Three times a day for 13.7 million years. Is there anyone here who will ever believe that in the 13.7 million years of just pouring paint on a canvas, this will ever make that? In 13.7 million years, you ain't never by chance going to get what you see on this picture of design. You will never look up and get that. If there is design, I do not have to convince you there is a designer. This tells you somebody did this. Just by the complexity, the trees, the shadows, just by the complexity that is in that picture alone, it proves without a doubt that nobody in this building can deny. The moment you see it, you know somebody did it. A designer did it. Therefore, it was created. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that I can pour paint down on a canvas for 13.7 million years and we're never going to look up and have the complexity in this simple picture. So then I would ask you, what is more complex, that beautiful picture with those colors or the universe? Our universe, mankind, this body that is, the Bible says, wonderfully and fearfully made. We're going to now look at that simple picture and say it demands a designer, and we're not going to look at the universe and say it demands a designer. At that point, we have proven ourselves to be dishonest, and we have an agenda. For if that picture declares a designer, if that picture tells you somebody had to do it, and yet you can look at the entire complexity of the whole universe and this creature of creation and say it just happened, even this simple picture proves that a person would have to be a stone-cold liar and in pure denial of the facts and the truth to look at this universe of which if the sun was any closer we would scorch if the sun was any further we would freeze there's a thing that they call irreducible complexity 
Irreducible complexity simply means this. It means that there are several different things that makes one system work. And if any one of those things involved is not there, the whole system is gone. If we look at the simply, simple clotting of the blood, you know, when you get cut, something has to come in for your defense. This body had to be designed to take care of itself. So if you get cut, instantly something takes place called clotting of the blood. The blood has to clot to stop it from bleeding or either you're going to bleed to death. And what it is that causes that clotting is a protein. But the protein that causes the clotting has to be turned on by an amino acid. So which one in evolution which one showed up first? Well, the protein didn't show up first because this particular protein is of no value, nor can it function, nor can it operate. It's useless if the amino acid is not there to turn it on for the purpose of clotting the blood. Why would the amino acid be here first if the protein here, which it was designed to work on, is not present? it then would be rendered useless. So the amino acid has to turn on the protein. The protein then starts the clogging. But then there are many other substances in the body that once the clotting takes place and it's time for it to stop, these other systems now has to go in and turn the protein off. So, the protein has no value whatsoever without the amino acid. The amino acid has no value whatsoever without the protein. The protein is going to kill you one way or the other if the other systems is not involved to turn it off. It's very simple. If you have the protein, if you have the amino acid to turn the protein on to start the clotting of the blood, but you do not have the other things involved in turning it off, then your blood is going to become coagulated and you're going to die from clotting. On the other hand, if the amino acid is not there and you get cut and it's not there to turn the protein on, you're going to bleed to death. In this case, the entire system is gone if one component of it is not working. That's complex. That's far more complexity than this picture. And this picture has already proved to you by your common sense alone that somebody immediately looking at it, because of the detail of it, somebody had to do it. Then you look at the complexity of just this protein that clots your blood and this amino acid that turns the protein on and the others that turns the protein off. And how that that whole system fails if one single component is not working. So what it says is this that I've described to you of the simple clotting of the blood. If you have agreed that that picture means somebody did it, you have to agree that somebody did this. Because this is far more complex than that picture that every one of us agreed somebody had to do it. Well, this is about a gazillion times more complex than that. But we will agree that that picture had to have someone do it because it's got painted trees in it. But we will then at the same time say that this magnificent system just to stop the clotting of your blood just happened. It defies all logic. It defies all reason. The Bible said the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Because for any fool or anyone in this building or any in science classes or any debate, if I hold that picture up that I showed you at the beginning, there is nobody in the world that can say 
nor would they even risk their reputations to stand up and say, no, that picture is a result of somebody just dropping some paint on the canvas. Now, what we got here, brothers and sisters, is we have evidence that God is, in fact, guilty of creating the universe. There's a thing called a hydrological system. The waters of the river feeds the ocean. The evaporation takes place. Waters is sucked up in the cloud from the ocean. The wind blows the clouds across the land, and then the cloud drops the water, which refills the rivers, and then the rivers read just never ending. That's why they call it the hydrological cycle. It just keeps going. And you know what? It never fails. That's way more complex than this picture that we all agree demands somebody did it. The hydrological system is far more complex than that. How then in God's name can we look at that simple picture and say it demands that somebody outside of it put it together and we can look at the hydrological system and say, oh, it just evolved. It's nonsense. Why do you think that the Bible said the fool has said there is no God. This is why. It defies all common sense. Forget the hardcore scientific 16-letter words. It defies common sense. Speaking of this hydrological system, it, one of the things it explains what it is, it simply says that the water cycle, likewise referred to as a hydrologic cycle, is the evaporation of water primarily from the oceans to form clouds which are blown by the wind over the land where it falls as rain and runs back into the ocean by means of the rivers, what I just explained to you. Now, we ask, when was the hydrological cycle discovered? Well, it tells us here that Bernard Palissy is the one credited with the discovery of the hydrological system. And Mr. Palissy discovered it in 1580 A.D. That's 1,580 years after Christ died. Mr. Palissy discovered this hydrological system 1,580 years after Jesus died. But almost 1,000 years before Jesus died, there was a wise man named Solomon that wrote this in Ecclesiastes 1.7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto a place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. A man a thousand years before Jesus died on a cross, a thousand years basically before Jesus came, told us in the Bible, gave us a perfect description of the hydrological system. But yet they say it was discovered by Mr. Polisi almost 2,000 years later. And they credit a man in 1580 AD as telling us what the hydrological system is when we read of it 2,000 years earlier, written plainly for us to read in the Word of God by King Solomon. The question then is, how did Solomon know this? Solomon didn't have telescopes. Solomon did not have all of the advanced tools of science. He didn't have any of it. How did Solomon know this? God showed it to him. More evidence. Then I'll close with this. There was and is a star system that's called the Pleiades. The book of Job speaks of the Pleiades. This is the oldest book in the Bible, 5,000 years ago. He speaks of the seven sisters of the Pleiades, that is, the seven stars of the Pleiades. The Pleiades is a cluster of stars like the Milky Way and so forth and so on. Now, the only problem was, was that they did not discover the seventh star because the seventh star in the Pleiades is not visible to the human eye. 
And only until the late, late 1800s, early 1900s, when the modern telescopes was invented, only then did they see what they could not see with the naked eye. Only then did they see, lo and behold, the seventh star in the Pleiades. How did a man 5,000 years before that know of the Pleiades? How did he even know the name existed? How did he even know that that cluster of stars was called the Pleiades? How did he know it had seven stars when only six are visible? And he's supposed to be ancient trash living in caves, rubbing wood together to make him a flame of fire. But yet Solomon gave us graphic detail of the hydrological system. Yet Job gave us graphic detail of the Pleiades and the star that nobody can see. So the bottom line is, is did God create this or did he not? What does the evidence show? The evidence shows that the creation, and I close, we should call this the closing arguments. The creation that is spoken of in the book of Genesis, God created, and the created act then that took place, is plainly said that it was on this earth. Evidence number one. The creation act that the Bible declares took place by God was located on this planet. It makes that clear. To this present date, the only planet in our universe that has life is this one. That's evidence. God said he made you out of dirt. And everything that is in the dirt is in your body. That's evidence. Nothing scientifically spoken of in this ancient book has ever been wrong. That's evidence. The hydrological system that no man knew about and a man given credit in 1580 for finding out is clearly we read a thousand years before Solomon described it in detail. Therefore, those who say that Mr. Polisi discovered the hydrological system without question is wrong. That's not even a matter of opinion. You have the Bible, you have the evidence. You can go look at what time Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. In 1 7 of Ecclesiastes, you can read the words that Solomon wrote, which proves they're wrong about who discovered the hydrological system. That's evidence. So, brothers and sisters, I think with just this little, and please understand, all of this with the proteins and the amino acids and the hydrological system, I promise you I can give you 500 of these. But I figured this would be enough for today, ending up with exactly where we started. Here is a canvas that I just opened paint and dropped on. That's evolution. Here's a paint that was actually painted, a picture that was actually painted. I didn't have to convince anybody in here that somebody painted this. The minute you saw it, you saw order. You saw some level of complexity. You automatically knew somebody did this. So if something that has even the smallest hint of design, such as this picture, Tells you straightway a designer had to do it. There is no other answer. Then we will look at all of the things pertaining to our universe, our galaxies, the functioning of this human body. How in God's name could anybody refuse to accept the fact that you are here because of God created you? But just what I've presented today on something lower than a layperson's level. Nobody can deny, except they be a fool, on a mission to disprove the obvious. There is a God. He is alive. He is the creator. 
We are going to spend eternity with him just like he said. Or we are going to spend eternity in a hell fire, which is the second death, just like he said. What do we find in this court today, in this trial, of which we ask, is God guilty of creating all things guilty?